Milwaukee. Look, it's the uh, viewers out there. Hey, folks, Alex Jones here. I want to wish you a wonderful Thanksgiving with your family here in the United States and wish everybody goodwill across the planet. This is going to be the intro to InfoWars Nightly News this evening, and then we're going to have uh, a retransmission of the groundbreaking interview with Charlotte Iserby, Skull and Bones Blown Wide Open. So that's coming up in just a moment. But uh, Rocky is Aaron Dyke's dog, and I personally have really gotten to know Rocky over the years, and I really, really like him. But he, he doesn't like being held up like that. He likes laying prone here. Rob, you want to give him a video shot here uh, of uh, Rocky? Sure. Now, now, then, now, 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 this is where Rocky really likes to be. He is uh, absolutely happy and lavishing himself. No, seriously, it's little sweet creatures that are important in this world especially not just our dogs, but our children. And it's their future that we're fighting for. And it's up to us that are aware of what's happening in the world and those of us that are men uh, to stand up for human society uh, against tyranny. It's up to us to protect little ones like Rocky. And so without further ado, I will now hand Rocky to uh, Rob Jacobson. Tell it's a very spoiled animal, likes me, by the way, because I feed it treats here at the office. That dog, like, you'll see a little shadow dart by here at the office, and it's rocky. All right, so it's InfoWars Nightly News. It is November 24th, 2011, and here is the Charlotte Israby interview. This is the first hour of it. Aaron's got a few other hours, I think seven hours total. He, he, he edited eight hours down to one hour, and there's going to be another part two, part three coming out. Uh, but it, th th this is really the ruling class here in America. They're very cold-blooded people. They've scientifically studied how humans operate, and it's a group of, of psychopaths that developed modern psychology as a way to really end our species as we know it. Uh, this is the ultimate revolution against the species itself. These people are truly wicked. So here is Charlotte Iserby, Skull and Bones, blown wide open. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks for joining us on Thanksgiving evening. Skull and Bones, the order at Yale, 15 of them selected out of every junior class. They paid. Wall Street financed Hitler, financed Stalin, creating communism, which is what they did. That's all very bad, and Skull and Bones is all involved in that with the order. Uh, they concerned the uh, build-up of the three types of socialism, uh, Bolshevik socialism in Russia, um, what we might call welfare socialism in the United States and uh, Hitlerian or national socialism. And each book examines the financing and the contributions made by Wall Street by international bankers to, that, to the development of that specific form of socialism. It also was involved in changing the American education system from a classical academic brain-oriented thinking, destroying that, and imposing an uh, animal training method, which Skull and Bones were deeply involved, and I think I would just say the only entity at that time deeply involved, and managed to bring that wretched system of operant conditioning, Pavlov, Skinner, whatever you want to call it, animal training, out of the laboratory in Leipzig, Germany, Wilhelm Wundt, and get it adopted by leading American educators. Motivation and reward are crucial factors in learning. A motivated animal will learn any response which occurs and is promptly followed by a reduction in the strength of the drive. My father and grandfather were members of the order. Skull and Bones was put together by William Russell in 1830, secret society at Yale University. And uh, the connections with Germany are pretty extensive. You know, the, the, the Illuminati, I think uh, it's got to be, I think that there's a lot of research out there that I haven't even read that is there that does connect it with the Illuminati. And the Illuminati, of course, was Bavarian. Marxist society based on getting, destroying the family, destroying the church, which at that time was Catholicism, uh, destroying uh, 
religion, we're destroying national entities, boundaries, uh, no more. I, I have, you know, the proofs of conspiracy by Robeson, the, an original copy of that, and it says right in there, you know, where the uh, order, it's interesting, the order, right? The goal was to, just as I said, down with the family, down with the royalty. At that time, governments were royalty, and, and they were religious. That was Western European, right? Uh, down with uh, nationalism, get rid of countries, drop borders, drop borders. I mean, and people think that that's new? The Illuminati order, this is really, this is skull and bones, see? The Illuminati order documents show that Raphael in the Illuminati is identified as the same Professor Carl Casimir Wundt. This is fascinating. Kirchenrat Carl Casimir Wundt, the one we're talking about, was professor at Heidelberg University in the history and geography of Baden, this town, and pastor of the church at Weiblingen, a small neighborhood town. So Wundt was connected with the Illuminati, his grandfather. Well, this is the background of Wilhelm Maximilian Wundt, who really trained the American educators in the behavioral psychology, the stimulus response uh, training type of uh, Skinner opera conditioning, bells, whistles, all that stuff, which does not teach, it trains for the, for the workforce. Now, this was uh, the order at Yale was directly connected with Wilhelm Wundt. They sent educators over there to study under Wundt. Stanley Hall was the first one to go. This is so important, this stuff here. Hmm. The Hegelian influence on Hall. Between 1870 and 1882, a span of 12 months, Hall, an American, there's a lot of information on him here too, but I won't go into it, he was connected with Skull and Bones prior to going over. They probably sent him over. Spent six years in Germany. And he says, I do not know of any other, this is Hall talking, any other American student of these subjects, philosophy and psychology, who came into even the slight personal contact it was my fortune to enjoy with Hartman and Fechner. There were psychologists over there as well. Nor of any psychologist who had the experience of attempting experimental work with Helmholtz. And I think I was the first American pupil of Wundt. Now Wundt is the one we're dealing with, Wilhelm Wundt from Germany. He had the first laboratory, and people think that American psychology and all was, uh, the psychologist studied under Pavlov, that Pavlov was the first, no, Pavlov, interestingly enough, studied under Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig. The 12 years included in this span as an American pupil of Wundt, more than any other equal period, marked and gave direction to modern psychology. Wilhelm Wundt, 1832 to 1920, professor of philosophy at University of Leipzig, was undoubtedly the major influence on G. Stanley Hall who was subsequently, who he trained, you know, all the others, Thorndike, Dewey, and all of them, okay? And he was sent over Hall. The, it, it appears that he had a lot of connections with the order at Yale, and that's why he ultimately ended up going to Leipzig. Uh, modern education sta practice stems from Hegelian social theory combined with the experimental psychology of Wilhelm Wundt, the Hegelian theory, you know, create the problem, people scream, impose a solution type of thing. And no right, no wrong, too. Whereas Karl Marx and von Bismarck applied Hegelian theory to the political field, it was Wilhelm Wundt, influenced by Johann Herbart, who applied Hegel, the Hegelian dialectic, to education, which in turn was picked up by Hall and John Dewey, and modern educational theorists in the United States. If that's to create the problem and people scream and pose a solution. That's the, Hag that's the Hegel. Wundt is the animal training method that bypasses the brain.
Wundt is important in the history of American education for the following reasons. He established in 1875 the world's first laboratory in experimental psychology to measure individual responses to stimuli. Two, Wundt believed that man is only the summation of his experience, the stimuli that bear upon him. It follows from this that for one, man has no self-will, no self-determination. Man is in effect only the captive of his experiences, a pawn needing guidance. Three, students from Europe and the United States came to Leipzig to learn from one the new science of experimental psychology. These students returned to their homelands to found schools of education or departments of psychology and trained hundreds of PhDs in the new field of psychology. The core of our problem is that once work was based on Hegelian philosophical theory and reflected the Hegelian view of the individual as a valueless cog in the state, a view expanded by want to include man as nothing more than an animal influenced solely by daily experiment experiences. This Wundian view of the world was brought back from Leipzig to the United States by G. Stanley Hall and other Americans and went through what is known among psychologists as the Americanization of Wundt. Although Hall was primarily psychologist and teacher, his political views were partially Marxist, as Hall himself writes, quote, I had wrestled with Karl Marx and, and half accepted what I understood of him. Confessions, and don't forget Karl Marx used the Communist Manifesto was basically Weishaupt. It's important to remember that. Huh? So this is really a very, this is a very fine chapter out of Sutton's book, America's Secret Establishment. How the, this is a chapter, how the order controls education. And I want to point out that nobody but Sutton in the writings on the order has ever really de dealt with education. Sutton saw the importance. I mean, he'd been doing all the work on our, you know, aid to the Soviet Union on technology and all for the Hoover Institute. Um, but he really, uh, he's the only one who ever connected the order with education. Ex yeah, you know, even this great book uh, that we've all, that, that Sutton Le Leipzig Connection, this great book, uh, I don't believe that Paoli Leone uh, understood the connection with the order either. He wrote about Wundt. It's a fantastic little book. You couldn't get it. The, you know, the viewers can get this book. I think it's, you know, there are a few very important books on education. I'd say that this is the number one book on education that's ever been written, this little book. And I think uh, Anthony Sutton agreed because he got a lot of his work in, in his book on the order from the Leipzig Connection as well. If we want to start with the condition of the average American right now, uh, who has been conditioned uh, by the t television and in the schools and pretty much in daily life, you know, with the community councils and all. Just, it goes away from the individual. Everything is to get... Well, John Dewey said it. We have to get rid of the individualism. Everything goes towards the collective, the group. And for ever since the early 60s or 50s, they've had the training sessions going on. They started in Bethel, Maine, National Training Labs, to uh, use sensitivity training to bring people together in groups, and they'd all spill their guts about everything. And once you've done that, you're dependent on that person, right? Because they know everything about you. So this is the way you form the collective. It really is very interesting, the sensitivity training, how it works. And it says right in the original documents that it's Chinese communist thought control. Well, Americans have been exposed to this now, you know, since certainly since World War II. And they've become little collectivists, really, groupies. They think that way. Anybody who thinks as an individual really is looked at uh, askance, you know, strange person, you know having an opinion that is opposite to what I've heard every night on the TV or in school or in college. Strange person, these individualists, huh? So that's what we're looking at now. We've, we finally uh, 
This is very interesting right now. I mean, talking about the Rockefeller Foundation, the General Education Board of Carnegie, you have, uh, this is the chart, uh, showing that the University of Chicago, the School of Education, which had John Dewey and Charles Judd were there. Columbia University Teachers College, John Dewey Thorndike, who had his pet chickens that he trained, James E. Russell, and uh, then James McKell at the in the Department of Psychology at Columbia. All of those those were all funded and Hopkins Medical School by Rockefeller Foundation's General Education Board and Kearney Foundation. Now when you think back to everything I've been talking about, the Carnegie conclusions and recommendations to change uh, the American education, 1934, to change American education from the standard, you know, classical education that we have, basically to outcomes-based ed, because Carnegie, after they wrote that nifty little blue book that outlines a socialist America, using Carnegie's views, uh, they, uh, they had something called the eight-year study the Carnegie Corporation, which uh, we didn't realize until I read something in, in edu uh, the Education Commission of States used to have, or still does, maybe in Denver has a um, newsletter. And I was reading it one day, and at the bottom of the page, I just saw something, and it said, uh, OBE is simply the, because we were fighting OBE, outcomes-based education, performance-based education for workforce training, performance, performance. And I turned the page, and I said, it's just a, a rerun, virtually, of the Carnegie Corporation's eight-year study in the 1930s. And I went, what? And then we went, and we got the whole eight-year study out of the University of Georgia library, because the editor of my book lives in Athens, Georgia. And we got the eight-year study. And the eight-year study actually is what they're putting in right now. It's the no grades. It's removing the Carnegie unit, which requires the old Carnegie unit. You guys went through it in school. You know, we all did. Uh, four, uh, four years of math, four science, four English, four history, whatever, in order to graduate. And all of that has been removed now because the student is, is, not, being, is not focusing on intellectual endeavor. It's workforce training. And so they're taking those years away, and they're taking A, B, C, D grades away. They're taking kindergarten 1, 2, 3 through 12 away. And the whole thing is an open system where the child proceeds at his own pace and has his own test. He's not being compared against anybody else, no competition, because he is the cog in the wheel. He's being trained for the state and the corporations not for his own upward mobility. Forget classical education. That's what they're putting in right now. They're calling it Reinventing Schools Coalition. And interestingly enough, why I should be living in this tall, small town of Dresden, Maine, where it's one of the pilots, one of the few in the country for it, I went over and I found out about it. Their whole goal was to turn education on its head into training which is exactly what they wanted to do, because if you take the Carnegie's little conclusions and recommendations for the social studies, forget social studies, okay, I don't know why they call it that really. It was really conclusions and recommendations for the destruction of American education, that little book. By putting that new system in, and uh, the very people who signed off on their report were involved in, in all of this, Columbia. Uh, George Counts, Rudd, uh, Ballou, you know, all the names. And, and so Carnegie, whereas you had uh, Hopkins and University of Chicago and all were putting in the method, Carnegie was advocating the change of our formerly free market system to a planned economy Soviet style through the schools. That's the little, black, little dark blue book, Conclusions and Recommendations. 
That is recommending a new form of government and economic system for the United States. And it clearly states in there, the American people are going to have to get used to this because this is the new order. That is, is, uh, these barriers are breaking down all over the world. We've got to have a world system and all. You know, this is all, uh, I mean, this isn't direct quotes, but this is what the book tells you. And that the curriculum has to be completely revised from the old classical curriculum to focus on world government, basically. That's that little 1934 book. So at the same time, you had uh, Columbia University and, and Dewey and all of them. Uh, Dewey, had, you know, a lot of them have been to the Soviet Union, George Counts, and they were just saying, this is the most wonderful system, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, I think Counts, recounted or recanted sort of at the end, you know, I think he realized because things were getting pretty brutal in the 30s under Stalin. Huh? It was pretty hard to defend the system. But anyway, the goal, I think people will always ask, well, why on earth did Wall Street finance the, Soviet, the Bolshevik Revolution? Why would they do that? Well, uh, I think they did it because Russia was a very, I don't think they did it because they were uh, atheists or one thing or the other. I mean, William Boyce Thompson, he was head of the first head of the Federal Reserve, I think. He, he put 100,000 of his own money into Russia. I think it was all greed, personally. I think that's why they initially started supporting the Bolshevik Revolution. I think they wanted to be in control of the natural resources. I'm talking about uh, America's Secret Establishment by Anthony Sutton. I knew Anthony Sutton. Uh, we met, uh, we, we both were working on US Soviet, ed Soviet uh, policy. I used to be in the State Department, so I was interested in that too. But one day, you know, he said, you know, I'm interested in uh, the influence of the order at Yale. And I said, oh, you, you are? And Interestingly enough, I had just the day before received the copies of the membership in three or four little little books. There, uh, actually, we can take pictures of them if you want. I have them. And he said, "You have the membership list." And I said, "Yes." And he asked me to send it to him, and I did. He promised he'd get them back, which he did. And he told me, he said, "Charlotte, I've been doing research for the Hoover Institute for." several years on U.S. aid to the Soviet Union and wondering what on earth are we doing? Why are we building up our enemy? I just can't, couldn't understand it. And he said, when I put all those names on the membership list that you had out on the dining room table, all of a sudden everything made sense. I saw the names of these very important people who were all involved in the defense contracts, who were involved in education going way back, everything. I saw what they were doing. And that was when he became, you know, even, he, he really, he really started focusing. And he wrote the book after he got the list. And I've always really liked that. This is a really good quote here that I like to use because, not just because the fellow that he's quoting was a friend of my father's, sort of interesting, uh, but because it's so, it tells you exactly how important the order of skull and bones at Yale is. People say, oh, it's a little boys club, and they ignore it. They ignore the fact that John Kerry and George Bush were both running for president. You know, they didn't, I mean, isn't this sort of weird that out of a, an organization that has a maximum, I don't know how many, maybe 12,000 members that, or less, you know, since, since its creation, I don't know how many there are, that we would end up in a country of, what, uh, how many million are we? Uh, uh, having, having two people running for president who are for out of Yale, the order of skull and bones? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. So anyway, this is a quote uh, that he has. Uh, this is from F. O. Matheson, who was skull and bones, 1923, and uh, my father was too, uh, to Donald Ogden Stewart, skull and bones, 1916, an older guy. In regard to Matheson, they called him Matty, Matty's upcoming appearance before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. 
So he's writing to his other Skull and Bones buddy, you know, soothing his concerns and saying, don't, you know, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll make it. We're going to get by here. You know, we're going to get our agenda in, basically. So Matheson says, quote, as long as we have somebody from Bones, himself, right, who can bring pressure on the committee, I should think we'll be all right. So that's a very important quote. Now, Sutton goes on here and he says, for over 170 years, these people have met in secret. From out of their initiates come presidents, senators, judges, cabinet secretaries, and plenty of spooks, CIA. They are token titans of finance and industry, and they have just recently installed a third skull and bones president of the United States, George Jr., right? George W. Bush's secret name is temporary. <laughs> his father, George H. W. Bush's bones name is Magog. And his grandfather, Prescott Sheldon Bush, stole for the order one of their prized possessions, Geronimo's skull. But the order of skull and bones secrets have always been safe with a press of which much they owned. They owned, and that's why I think earlier you saw in this video, I mentioned that, uh, or maybe I didn't, I have been writing letters to the press since 1975 that, with a direct quote from a communist that regionalism is communism. And I was, I've had other pu articles published, but they would never go near that. Either they would take that quote out, because that's a quote from a communist writer for the Daily World, writing for their own journal, The Daily World. And so th when you talk about the control of the press, it's complete, the, the major media. I don't have to tell you folks that probably, but anyway. All right, no, Skull and Bones, uh, Bones Men, in, uh, is, here's a little list. Time, Life, Fortune's Henry Luce, Newsweek's E. Roland Bunny Harriman, the Harriman, right? Uh, Cowles Communications, Alfred Cowles, National Review's William Buckley. Boy, he took us to the cleaners, didn't he? Atlantic Monthly's R.W. Davenport. I guess Buckley was the one that managed to get the, the conservatives in line. So they're supporting a planned economy and all, right? He said that he, he, he said that John Kenneth Galbraith was one of his best friends and he admired him. So, hmm? Did uh, you repudiate the Birchers? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yes. Went after the Birchers. He did terrible things, Buckley. Uh, Atlantic Monthly, Davenport, and among others. Uh, if the order uh, is mentioned in the establishment press at all, Bones is defined as just a staid wayside for students. Its glory faded. Uh, this book is extremely important. Uh, you can go on the internet to get it. You said Alex has got it, is that right? Uh, I think we did. You're right. Uh, Anthony Sutton was educated at universities of London, Gottingen, and California. While research fellow at the prestigious Hoover Institute, he produced the monumental three-volume series, Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development. Other books include The Best Enemy Money Can Buy, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, Wall Street and Hitler, and many others. All right, this is a picture of my grandfather. Samuel Clifton Thompson, born in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And this is taken, this picture is taken just before he went out to South Africa as a mining engineer to open up the gold mines in South Africa. I might point out that he was uh, the first member in the family uh, from the Order of Skull and Bones. Uh, and uh, you'll be seeing later, you're going to see a picture of uh, Grandpa and my father is coming up. Put down a little bit. Okay. There you go. Right there. Perfect. Thank you. And he lived out there from around 1897 and was there during the Boer War. And uh, they returned in 19, uh, the breakout of the First World War One. My father was born in South Africa, obviously. And uh, my grandfather met a lovely gal from South, from Australia. That was my grandmother. And uh, she, she had come, this is a very interesting story. She had come over with her father and 12 siblings on a sailing ship from Australia to Cape Town. Uh, my great-grandfather uh, from Australia uh, had emigrated from England and uh, was the clerk of the works or something in Melbourne, Australia. And they had all those children, and can you imagine traveling on a sailing ship back in 1895 or something? Uh, 
with all those children. And anyway, my grandfather somehow met, we don't know how, my grandmother. And they were married in Johannesburg in 1902. And he was a member of the order at Yale, and he was very close to Sir A. Bailey and some of the Fabian socialists. I don't really know I, what role he had in the activities of the order, but I would imagine some, because it was pretty big time gold mining, and he was very instrumental in opening up the mines there. So that's Grandpa Thompson. Here is a picture of the same Grandpa a little bit later with my father and my sister, Victoria. And uh, that's Grandpa. He's uh, being very grandfatherly. This is probably around 1930, this picture. And that's my dad uh, holding on to my sister, my dad Clifton, who subsequently was tapped for the order in, uh, for his class at Yale. And uh, with Grandpa, uh, the one that I spoke to you about, uh, who was the mining engineer that went from Pennsylvania to South Africa to open the gold mines in the late 1800s. This is an interesting picture here, which shows, um, I think that these are, this, is the whole, this looks like a bunch of skull and bones, friends. I do believe. I'm going to show you the picture and then I will identify a bit for you. Uh, the one in the front row um, is Charles Bofford. Uh, and then we have my father. I'll explain a little bit. It's difficult to hold this up. But the, the one in the front row in the middle is Charles Bofford, uh, a very close friend of my father's. And I, I really like Charles Bofford a lot. He ended up being uh, the legal counsel from Davis Polk, Wardwell, Sunderland, Kendall, to, for the Suez Canal Company and many, many other uh, high, high positions. He rose to the top, getting all sorts of honorary medals from foreign governments in Europe and everywhere, and uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and uh, a lawyer, and a very, very decent, nice man. He close to my father. Uh, he died about 25 years ago, I guess. He, interesting man. He was born in Connecticut, in uh, California, I believe. And n unlike the r other Bones uh, characters that were in that class, friends of my father's, uh, he had not been to prep school, one of the fancy prep schools on the East Coast. He he went to public school in California which I do believe they must have had extremely good public schools back then because Chuck Spofford was quite a scholar and he was a, a very good musician. And uh, very high up he became after World War II, which he served in in Europe uh, as a lieutenant or something. After he got out, he was promoted way high up to a, one of the top positions in NATO, the North American Treaty Organization, and went on to be very influential in diplomatic circles. Uh, this is coming from being a boy in the public school system uh, in California, uh, rising to just really the highest heights imaginable. So there's Chuck. The other members that are, list are shown there are uh, close friends of my father's, Rebel McCallum and uh, Fred Haynes, I think. I'm not going to tell you where they all are. My father is in the picture somewhere there in the second row, I think. And Edwin Blair, who uh, was called Mr. Yale always because he, uh, his, uh, he uh, was a great fundraiser for Yale. Um, so he was Mr. Yale. He was also the uh, gentleman that... Uh, invited my dad to go out to Bohemian Grove for uh, one week or whatever it was. Uh, that It was through Edwin Blair that my father did go out there, and he, when he returned, you know, he, uh, he wasn't terribly impressed with what was going on there. He said the food was excellent, the lectures were pretty good, uh, everything was done very nicely, but he would never go back. Uh, so I'm making excuses for my dad because I don't think he was ever really... Um, very happy with the agenda, the Yale agenda, the orders agenda, although he stayed close to his friends, as you can see in this picture. They're all having a very good time on someone's boat or on the dock somewhere.
This is the Skull and Bones grandfather clock. These clocks were given to members of the order when they got married. And my father uh, was married in 1927, I believe, and uh, he, he ordered the clock from a clockmaker in South Carolina, and the, I think that the order paid, pays for the clock. And uh, it was a gift, and all of them receive a, a clock when they get married. I believe that's the case. And uh, we had it in our house from the time I was born, of course. And I remember it best because it's so mellow. And I would, as a young child, you know, waiting for Santa Claus to arrive, go to bed at night, and the clock would, you know, go off at every hour. And my mom and dad, of course, were putting things under the tree and giving Santa Claus his, his peanut butter sandwich and banana. And I was sleeping and listening to the clock. And then finally around, you know, five, it would strike five, then six. And I'd know, well, I, am, I can get up now. And I'd run down and Santa Claus had been there and the sandwich had been eaten and the clock would strike 6.30 and then everybody would have to come down and deal with me. So I, I just have great memories of the clock and what, what the significance is with the clock. Uh, Dad used to always say, he was very firm about that. He never told us why, but don't ever let the clock wind down. Keep the clock wound sharp. And uh, always keep it five minutes ahead. And what that means, maybe it means they're five minutes ahead of everybody. The order has to keep five minutes ahead of all of us. Uh, and don't let it wind down because if you did that, they'd be getting five or ten minutes behind or more. And as a member of the family, you're, you never talk about the order. My father never discussed anything about, about the order of any significance, really. Uh, although, as, as we said earlier on, he very, most of his friends were very close. Uh, very close friends were the order and all of them, all the ushers in his wedding, were skull and bones. Uh, the order, and friends all the way through life. Uh, but that had nothing to do with his own personal beliefs and all. He, he, he did not, uh, he was not involved in any major um, political decisions affecting our country or our schools or anything. He was wonderful mayor of several towns, a very strict constitutionalist, which certainly doesn't go along with what the order stands for. I mean, he would really cause trouble on the board if anybody deviated from the Constitution. So that's just a little bit of a defense of, of a member of the order, my dad. And uh, as you heard earlier on, you know, before he died, he, he did say that uh, he would help me if he could, if he had longer arrived. So uh, hopefully there are more members who've come to that conclusion. And maybe someday we won't have a problem with the order. I hope that the order doesn't continue causing all of us the problems that it's caused in the past, though, especially in education. Now, uh, we're going to get into the books. The books are... Books were originally... They'd never published the list of members in book form before. At least that's what my father told me. One day when he was ill, this is the catalog of the membership of living members, volume one. I think it's around 1978, This, the date on this. Well, that one's 1977. Let's take a look at this. Uh, oh, no. See, this is October 1983. This is what happened. A dad... I was taking care of my father. He was dying of cancer in New Jersey, and my sister and I would rotate, go down there. We didn't want to put him in a nursing home. So uh, one day, it was pretty close to the end of his life, uh, the mail brought these two books in the mail, which are, one is this one, Volume 1, The Living Members, the catalog of the living members as of 1983. And this is the catalog of all the members as of May 1977. This is the living and the dead. 
as of May 1977. So this is really the updated one right here. Anyway, I was opening the mail because my father wasn't well. I was taking care of all the business things and uh, mail correspondence and and these arrived and so I took them into dad and he said, "Boy, he said they're getting pretty fancy up there in New Haven, you know." He said, "What are they doing? Uh, never been in book form before." And that was his little comment. And so I said, "Well, it, it is, you know." So uh, we, uh, around that time, I was working with Anthony Sutton on something because I was always very interested in U.S. policy towards the Soviet Union, and he was, had done such remarkable work, aside from his great book, which came out subsequently on the order, but his work at the Hoover Institute uh, in regard to United States uh, transfer of technology and all sorts of uh, information uh, and money, etc., to the Soviet Union from the time of the uh, Bolshevik Revolution. And so Sutton was very highly respected in that field. And, and he, he told me, we, it just was a fluke really, that he happened to call right at the time when the books had arrived because he said he couldn't understand what it was all about. And I said, well, you may be interested, I think, you know, in, in the order at Yale. And uh, he said, I am. He, he said, I am interested in that. He said, I, I don't understand the connection. And I, I told him that I had the list in book form. And he said, you do? And I said, yeah. And he said, would you um, mind lending them to me? And he said, I'll get them right back to you, I promise. And I believed him. And I sent them, and he did get them back, and he called me, and he said, uh, Charlotte, with all the research I've done through the years on U.S. aid to the Soviet Union and every imaginable aspect, once I got these lists copied, he went to a copying place to get, get it done. He must have done a pretty good job because they're still in good shape. Uh, I put them down on the dining room table, and I looked, and all of a sudden, I knew I, I had found what I was looking for. I'd found the names of the people involved in, in the foreign, foreign affairs of the United States, especially in the transfer of uh, secrets and weapons, etc., and nuclear stuff uh, to the Soviet Union, and uh, banking as, as well as banking and he said it, and he also mentioned Hitler he said I saw the movers and the shakers and it became very clear to me that this one organization was if not totally responsible almost all all, all, all completely you know really up there in responsibility for American foreign policy and economic policy and so, and then subsequently, uh, we found out education policy. I didn't know that uh, at that time that Sutton was that deep into do doing the research on education. I think he did the best job on education research of anybody I can possibly think of uh, using, and I'll show you in a minute, uh, the, the incredible research done by, uh, in the Leipzig Connection by Lance Leone, The Leipzig Connection. I'll show you a picture of that book later. Sutton used that. I used it. And uh, anyway, that is the history of these little, these little black books, which he returned to me. And he was a very great gentleman. He, he said, I, I really didn't ask him to keep my name private, but uh, he decided on his own uh, not to let anybody know uh, where he got them from. And evidently when... Uh, after my father died, uh, he he uh, he did, I guess, tell somebody, or maybe he didn't ever tell anybody. I, well, I don't, I'm not quite sure. I told people I didn't really care, you know. But I do want to point out right here at the end of my father's uh, illness, when he, before he died, because he had heard me discussing foreign affairs and and education, especially with Phyllis Schlafly, who was putting together the book. Uh, child Abuse in the Classroom, which is a great book for parents out there watching if they want to really find out all about all truly, do, you know, documented programs that were used in the schools between 1965 and 1985 when we had the Protection of Pupil Rights Amendment hearings. The, 
the documentation is in that book, Child Abuse in the Classroom, which is at americandeception.com. A marvelous book. And Phyllis and I, at this time, when I was taking care of my dad in 1984, were talking on the phone constantly about what was going on with global education, uh, all the horrible values-destroying programs, role-playing psychodrama, you, the worst stuff, death education, survival games where the kids have to decide who's going to be uh, allowed in the lifeboat and who isn't, depending on what your category is in life. Uh, this stuff, my father was listening from the other room because we had, we had him downstairs in a room next to the kitchen so that we could take care of him. And so he must have had some, I mean, I think I brainwashed him. <laughs> I think I brainwashed my father at the end of his life because a week before he died, he looked at me. First of all, I said, did he want to read the New York Times? He was not, he really was at the point where he didn't read much. And he did see, he, I, I gave it to him and he just threw it on the floor. He was lying in bed. He threw it on the floor and he said, you know, if I had more time, I'd help you. So that was uh, really wonderful, you know, that uh, at least I feel at the end of his life, uh, he, at least he understood his daughter. <laughs> that was nice to know. Um, he used to say to me, Char, you're a very good writer, but I don't know whether I like what you write about. And I thought, well, that's, that's a compliment from you. You're a good writer, too, and a speaker. He was always a very fine speaker. But uh, I thought, okay, I've come a long ways. He thought I was a good writer, but didn't like what I was writing about or what I was saying. And then finally he said, you know, if he had more time, he'd help me. So that, so you can say that with, I'm not making excuses for Skull and Bones members, but you could say that a good percentage of each class is really quite innocuous, even though they may still go to the island, you know, where they have the, the camping and all that, and Dad did that. And even though they may be bound to vote for the, the uh, Skull and Bones candidate, like my father always voted for Bush, and my mother was a Southern conservative who would vote for Barry Goldwater or make a mistake like I did and vote for Reagan. So they, their votes always canceled one another out because Dad would have voted Skull and Bones candidate, no matter what. Maybe they take a pledge or something. I don't know. Let's go for Dad. Uh, Thompson. I think I am even mentioned in this evil little book. Yes, I am. Thompson, 1924. There's Thompson. There's Thompson in 1924. And you will see there where he was born and uh, where he went to college, that he was married to my mother, that he was mayor of several towns. He was a very civic-minded person, and everybody loved him. He always got elected. The most generous person on earth that ever existed. If anybody had a problem, you know, he'd be right in on that, offering to help out no matter what. And a, he was a vestry man at the Episcopal Church, and... Uh, I don't know what else Dad was, except he was the order at Yale. <laughs> anyway, it, it, did you get that picture okay? I did. I can even see your name on there. Oh, good. So it says, uh, 1924, law retired, born January 3rd, 1903, Johannesburg, South Africa, where he resided, Mosley Road, Far Hills, New Jersey, worked at Appleton Rice and Pear in New York, council and director, Seba Corporation, 4664, Mayor, Sands Point, New York, 4047, member township committee, Mendham, New Jersey, 61 to 71. Married June 4, 1927, Charlotte Dyer. Uh, and daughter, Victoria Romig. And Charlotte, my goodness, my name is in the Skull and Bones little black book of members. I didn't even know that, huh? Well, good for you, Charlotte. Hmm? I wonder, I wonder what they say about me. Oh, they're so all to themselves, they probably don't even know about me. They probably don't even know about Dad anymore. So now we have, um, well, this is an interesting one here. Oh, look at all these bushes. Bush, 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 bush. <laughs> How about it? Let me give you a, there we are, look. 
1948, George Herbert Walker. Well, we're going to get a, oh, my representative to the UN, chairman of the Republic. This is a good one. George Herbert Walker, born in, you know, he must have graduated in 1948, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, born 1924 in Milton, Massachusetts, director of CIA, Washington, D.C., residence in Washington, and president and chairman Zapata Offshore Company, 58 to 66, member of U.S. Congress, 67 to 70, U.S. permanent rep to the United Nations, ambassador, 71 to 72, chairman, Republican National Committee, 73, 74, boy, he doesn't give up, does he? Chief U.S. Liaison Office, Peking People's Republic of China, 74, 75, lieutenant, junior grade, U.S. Navy, 42, 45, uh, th three air medals, married January 6th to Barbara, 1945, children, George W., 1968, John E., Neil M., huh, Marvin P., and Dorothy. Yep, okay. Then we have, gosh, George Jr., 1968, born, I mean, 19, he was, that was the class. He was born in 1946 in New Haven, resides in Houston, Texas. That's all they have for him. Oh, this is an old book, see? Yeah, okay. Then James, I never knew about James, did you? Yeah, he's the brother. Well, I've heard about him. Okay, and I knew about the girl, yeah. Bush, 1953, Jonathan. Oh, I knew about him. He used to leave it, park his car in our garden in Camden before he would go out on sailing trips. Somehow we, we must have met him. He was very nice, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, he'd, stay, he'd be gone for about a month on the island, whatever island, Vinyl Haven or one of them, and he would leave his car in our garage or in our parking lot. And I, he was a rather nice guy. And then we have Prescott. 1917. Uh, that's the year for him. That's important. He was born in 1895. Columbus, Ohio. Died in uh, October 8, 1972. New York, New York. Greenwich, Greenwich, Connecticut Republican Town Meeting, 32 to 52. Moderator. Yale Corporation, 44 to 58. U.S. Senator, from Connecticut, 52 to 63, that was a long time. Formerly partner Brown Brothers Harriman, see, he got all that. And in August 6, 1921, Dorothy Walker, married Dorothy Walker, and their children were George, Jonathan, William, and Nancy. Okay, uh, that's that. That's the bushes, we could go through a lot of people. You know what's interesting? Let's let's just take a look here. We're in BU. We're going to take a look at Buckley, huh? The great leader of the conservative movement, huh? Buckley. William Frank. He graduated in 1950. This is the, the guy that was put up there as a, and a good, you know, a friend of the socialist economist. What's his name? The really socialist economist? I can't remember his name. They were always such good friends. I always wondered how that could be. Hmm, no. Um, I can't remember right now, but he's very well known. Anyway, Buckley. Buckley. Ooh, gosh, there are a lot of Buckleys. There's Christopher Taylor, New York City author, editor, journalist. I wonder if he's related. Chief speechwriter, the Vice President of the United States. Buckley F Fergus Reed writing book. Paris, France, novelist and lecturer. They're all in, in media, right? It could well be they're related, huh? Then we have James. That he was Bill Buckley's brother. A pretty good guy, I believe. Um, he was president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, in Munich, West Germany. What a joke those places were. They really, they led the, uh, the poor Hungarians, you know, we, we, we let Hungary right, go down, right down the tube. We, we, we did all the broadcasting to get them to revolt with Radio Free Europe, and then they revolted, and then the Soviets struck in 1956, I guess, and the Hungarian Revolution. Horrible. 
So that's what Radio Free Europe did. Well, it must have done some good things. Okay. He was U.S. Senator from New York. Uh, in the Navy. Married. Peter. He was, he was U.S. Senator from New York for a sh very short time, and I wondered why. He went in and he never ran again. This is his brother. Okay, now, here we got William Frank Buckley. Uh, born in 1925. National, President National Review. Um, he was associate editor of American Mercury, which you see, so he was really, that was very good. That was a really true blue, wonderful conservative magazine that he was editor of. That's rather interesting. He went in there early to, you know, do damage everywhere, I guess. Uh, Editor-in-chief, National Review, syndicated columnist, TV host, Firing Line, chairman of the board, Star Broadcasting Group, author of several books, appointed by Nixon to five-member USIA Advisory Committee, 1969, appointed by the president, public member of the U.S. delegation to, uh-oh, 28th General Assembly of the U.N., host of PBS Great Performance as Brides Had Revisited, Second Lieutenant U.S. Infantry. Well, that must have been tough. I, what, when was that? 44 to 46. Right at the, you know, that's the nasty end of the war. Married to Patricia Taylor. Okay. Bundy. No. <laughs> but he was confirmed CIA, wasn't he? He certainly was. With Ward, what's his name, and all of them. Maybe they don't put that in. CIA, huh? And here we got Frederick McGeorge Bundy, the one that's listed in the NEA's Cardinal Principles Pre-Planning Board. This is very important. So at the top, the NEA has all these characters, these rotten leftists, educators and government people, top skull and bones people. All right, there's McGeorge Bundy, and there is Frederick McGeorge Bundy. Isn't that interesting? So McGeorge Bundy's the one we want. His brother was the other one. Is that something? Two brothers were the order at Yale. This is sort of fascinating stuff. And then William Bundy. All right, McGeorge Bundy. And remember that he was listed on the NEA's uh, Cardinal Principles Revisited, 1976, which was the total international world government document, education for a world government, basically. He was listed with all the rotten educators, Theodore Sizer, oh, everyone you could imagine. And anyway, here we go. And Rockefeller, David Rockefeller, which makes one ask at the top of the NEA, how many teachers know that the NEA at the top is allied with the Rockefellers and the insiders and the establishment and the, and the very people that everybody will tell you the NEA abhors. So anyway, here we go, McGeorge Bundy, born 1919, professor of history, NYU, lived at 133 East 80th Street, New York. They all have good addresses. Uh, lecturer, associate professor of government, dean of faculty, arts and sciences, 53 to 61 at Harvard. Arts and sciences, that's interesting, huh? Special assistant for national security affairs to President Kennedy and Johnson, 1961 to 66. President of the Ford Foundation, okay, Rowan Gaither, 1966 to 79. He was 10 years after Gaither. He knew, same thing that Gaither told Dodd. Captain A, a, a U, United States, 1942 to 1946. Can you imagine? They were really in nasty wars and all. Uh, maybe that's what caused them to be so world government oriented. I don't know. M well, they learned it at the order at Yale, I guess. Um, okay, nothing more of interest there. Married to Mary Lothrop, the children and all. And William Bundy, okay, this is another one. This is the other one that's important. Uh, journalism, born, uh, this has got to be his brother. Editor of Foreign Affairs, okay, CFR. Uh, uh, Yale Corporation, Covington, Berlin Law Firm. He's a very important one, this one. 
um, columnist Newsweek. Uh, oh, whoa. Staff Director, President's Commission on National Goals. That was a bad commission. Uh, Maureen Heaton covered that in her book. National Goals, all right. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, International Security Affairs. Uh, ooh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, 64 to 69. Major Army Signal Corps, August 41. They were all in the war. Legion of Merit, British MBE. Married to Mary Atchison, I wonder if that's Dean Atchison, Michael and Christopher. Okay, well, you know, really, these people are something else, aren't they? They are important. They are very important.